And we are live. Hello, everyone. Glad you can join me today. As you can see, I'm trying out a new uh, name for the show. And the name is Let's Talk. Because we talk about a lot of different things, don't we? So the thing we're going to be talking about today are political misconceptions and how to find winning candidates. So how can you predict a candidate is going to win well before it actually happens? And before I get started, I have my NASA shirt on in honor of yesterday's episode, which yesterday's episode was really fantastic. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you do. And I had a lot of fun talking about it, but the future of space and space economy and the next trillion dollar industry, it's going to be happening in space. And I laid it all out and it was a fantastic time. But today I want to switch gears a little bit. And I told myself that I didn't want to talk about anything politics related unless I saw no one else talking about it. So if no one else is talking about this one thing I think is interesting, then I feel sort of obliged to cover it because then when everyone does start to talk about it, I look like a genius because I predicted it, you know, well ahead of time. And I think we're going to see a lot more people talk about this topic, but I'll give maybe people a few moments to join us. Hello, everyone that is here. If you're unfamiliar with Periscope, you can type in the chat and it pops up and I get to see it and we can converse live that way. So that's always good. I have my coffee, of course. But I wanted to talk today about there's, there's a misconception that always gets played out in the media every time around election cycles. And, and this, this misconception is that the politician or the person or candidate that's running for office that best matches the attitudes of the public is the one that's going to win. So this idea that the candidate who is able to best discover the policies that the people want and whoever has the best policies win. Unfortunately, that, well, fortunately or unfortunately, I won't make any judgment, but that doesn't seem to be the case. And I want to talk about a few examples where we can see that that hasn't happened at all. And the one example I think most tellingly is 2016 when Donald Trump was running. Now, when he was running for office, one of the first big things that he came out and, and talked about was the border wall. So his first thing was build the wall. And his topic, you know, overarching theme was immigration. And immigration was one of the first things they talked about. But if you remember, in 2015, 2016, immigration was not very high on the public's list of things that are important. And going back to 2012, do you remember what the top thing that was important in people's minds was? It wasn't immigration. Immigration was pretty low on the list. I think in, I, I remember seeing a ranked list of policy issues that were important and immigration was somewhere between fifth and eighth. So not, you know, not that no one cared, but it wasn't very high on people's priority list. What was number one during that time was income inequality because that was during the Occupy Wall Street movement, if you remember Occupy Wall Street. And income inequality was the thing that was on everyone's minds. But Trump comes along in 2015 and starts to talk about immigration. And all of a sudden, immigration shoots up the list. So what does that tell you? It tells you that there's two types of candidates. And this is how you can tell who's who's really going to win. And there's two types of candidates. The first type is the candidate that reacts to public opinion. So this is the type of candidate that does a lot of polling and they try and figure out what it is that people think. And then they try and match that. They say, okay, this is going to be my policy agenda because this is what people want. The issue is sometimes people don't know what they want. There's the known knowns, there's the known unknowns, and then there's the unknown unknowns, right? So there's things we know, there's things we know that we don't know, and there's things that we don't even think about. What a good candidate is able to do is talk about issues and bring issues to the national light that no one else was talking about before. And what that does is it makes the entire conversation in the media and in people's conversations, when you're the one that brings up the issue and no one else is talking about it, that means whenever someone is talking about the issue, by extension, they're talking about you as a candidate because you are the person who brought it up. So Trump quite brilliantly 
identified immigration as something that he could bring up that would be able to have a lot of visual examples, something that he could bring up and, and, and provide powerful stories around, and it's something that he could shape the conversation around. And if you remember the Republican Party back in 2015, before 2015, we'll, we'll say, there was pretty much a, a unanimous idea that amnesty was going to be the thing that was going to happen, or they were going to become more uh, liberal with their immigration policy. And I'm not saying that's good, I'm not saying that's bad, but that's just what was happening. And so they were talking about what can we, how can we make all the undocumented citizens in the country today, how can we make them legal, what can we do to, you know, open up the border a bit, make that process easier. And amnesty was the big thing that people were talking about. So it seemed as if the left had won that battle. And then Trump comes along and completely changes the direction. So everything changes course after Trump. And that was, you know, quite a... Uh, it was a good political play on his part. I won't say it was good, I won't say it was bad, but it was a very good political play on his part to identify this thing and, and to push it into the national conversation because it meant that everyone now had to talk about him whenever they were talking about the issue. And as you can see, Trump is really one of the masters of media manipulation in that he's very good at keeping his name in the public conversation. And there was a lot of times where he was just sucking all the energy right out of the room and really he was the only one that the media could talk about. So the one type of candidate is the one that reacts to public opinion and the other one is the candidate that shapes public opinion. So this is the candidate that comes out with a policy or an idea or a proposal and then the people then start to come around to his way of thinking. And you know there's a lot that's been talked about and written about leadership and I won't go too much into that, but being able to come up with an idea and then have people get behind you is a little bit harder to do than agree with everyone that's out there and say, what do you want? Okay, let's do that. Because the, it goes to this issue of, of intellectual trust and emotional trust. So a lot of politicians, when they're crafting their policies, they're trying to get the public to think that they're a very smart person and that they're, they're the most capable and smartest person in the room, and they're trying to get them to intellectually trust them. So here are my policies. You agree with these policies. Therefore, you agree with me. Vote for me. And it kind of goes on this rational, intellectual trust. Now, the problem is, if you're a candidate, having people intellectually trust you it's good, but it's not great, and it's kind of a non-starter as far as what you want. And the reason is because as soon as, as, soon as the people believe that the facts have changed, uh, they're going to leave you and go to another candidate. Or as soon as you do something that they don't agree with, then they're gone. And there are times where, as a candidate, you might be privy to more information than the general public has, and you might have to make decisions that don't make sense unless you have the access to the information or you have the perspective that the candidate has. And so having people intellectually trust you, it, it, can, be, it, can, it can have a lot of problems. Rather, what you would rather have is people emotionally trust you. And the big big example of this is Nixon goes to China, and I'll talk about that in a bit, but when people emotionally trust you, they will let you do things that they don't even agree with. So people emotionally trust you, you can do things that they would otherwise not do, or they wouldn't be supportive of you doing, because they trust your intention, and they trust that, they trust where you're coming from, right? And so the big uh, example of this was Richard Nixon, had a whole campaign railing against China and Chinese influence, and a lot of his base was supportive of that. So, when he goes to China later on in his, uh, in his presidency, when he ends up going to China, a lot of his base that would have otherwise been opposed to it was instead very supportive of it, or at least they were willing to see how it was going to play out, because they trusted uh, Richard Nixon in regards to China. And they thought that, well, he thought the same way we did, so if his mind was changed, there must be some good reason for it. And we trust him emotionally, and we'll let him go ahead and do whatever it is that he feels that he should do, because there's that level of emotional trust. But if they intellectually trusted him, and they trusted him as some great mind, and, and but they weren't sure of his intentions, or they weren't sure about him as a person, in that circumstance, uh, the Chinese play doesn't work at all, and his own base would have, uh, you know, killed him over it. So. 
those are the two types of candidates. And the reason why I bring this up is because it seems as if Bernie did that in 2016. And the reason why he had, I, he probably would have been the candidate, right, if it wasn't for the the Democratic Party nomination process with all the superdelegates, <clears throat> with all the superdelegates, excuse me. But that process has changed. Now the superdelegates can't assign their votes until a candidate has more than 50% of the vote. And it's, it gets technical, but in other words, the power of the superdelegates in choosing the nominee is a lot l more lessened. It's lessened than it was in 2016. So that means that there's a lot more opportunity for a black swan, dark horse candidate to come about. And I'm, I've been talking about Andrew Yang a lot, and I, I'm not sure if this is going to happen, but I would like to make a prediction so I can be the first one on record, and I can be the first person to talk about it and be the first person. And, uh, you know, you have to take risks if you're going to be first. And <laughs> generally, historically, it doesn't work out too well for the person who's first, but, I, you know, that, that's not too important to me. What's important is uh, that people, what's important is sort of the ideas that this candidate is talking about. And by this candidate, I mean Andrew Yang. And so I'm going to make a prediction that, well, let me clarify what I said before. What's important to me is that people start recognizing what makes candidates good candidates. And good candidates are the candidates that are able to get a lot of energy and they're able to shape the discussion. Because if you start looking for candidates that you agree with, you're going to be disappointed and you're not going to understand when they lose. Because you're going to think that, you know, everyone should think the same way that you do because, you know, these are the facts and the facts don't change, et cetera, et cetera. But people are going to come with their own opinions and you're going to be surprised when the candidate you like doesn't win. And the reason is because the, unless your candidate has the ability to get a lot of energy and a lot of support and they're able to shape the discussion, you're going to have a, a, a much, you're just not going to win unless you can do those things. But Andrew Yang seems to have come on the scene talking about universal basic income, and he's getting a lot of what I would classify as Bernie-like 2016 support. So the same uh, phenomena that was happening early in the Bernie days is happening with Andrew Yang, and that's, that's very interesting to see, because the candidates that have the most energy generally are the ones that do the best. And I want to talk about an example, and I tweeted this out on my Twitter timeline, so if you haven't seen it, go to my timeline and you can watch it. But it was a video from Time Magazine, and Time Magazine was talking about the 2020 presidential hopefuls, so the nominees for the 2020 presidential race. And it, the, the story here isn't the video. What, whether you watch the video or not is, is not important. Rather, what's important was the comment section, because Time, in their biopic of all the different candidates, forgot one. Well, they forgot a few, but the one that everyone was talking about was Andrew Yang. And you saw the comment section just flooded with Andrew Yang comments. Now, that's interesting, because the Internet seems to be a microcosm of society at large. And I wouldn't say that's a representative sample, but the trend does matter. And what that means is, you know, if people are not talking about someone, and then all of a sudden they are talking about him, and in a way that can influence discussions and take over entire comment sections, et cetera, et cetera. That's something that you have to pay attention to because that's something that was happening to Bernie. And I think Bernie got a lot of pop early because he got a lot of celebrity endorsements. Uh, Sarah Silverman was one of the early ones and, you know, I know Killer Mike is still really big on Bernie. So, you know, got a lot of celebrity endorsements. But Andrew, I think, is going to be coming around and getting a lot of internet attention. And once the inter once you have the internet's attention, that can really carry you a long way. So I'm going to make a prediction, and the prediction, <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be true, but you know it's something I can modify later anyway, so it doesn't matter. But my prediction is that Andrew Yang is going to be the presidential, uh, the Democratic nominee for president. That's going to be my prediction. And the reason is because I looked at all the other candidates and they don't seem to fulfill my criteria. None of them seem to be shaping the discussion. They seem to be reacting to it. 
they don't seem to be shaping public opinion. They seem to be reacting to it. And they don't have any sort of organic energy. The one exception being Bernie, who kind of shaped the discussion in 2016. And the support that he has right now, I mean, he had a big rally this past weekend in Chicago, 12,500 people. And that's good, you know, but in a, in a play, I would have been more, I would have been more impressed if he got half of that in Vermont or half of that in Iowa, you know, states that are going to really be influential, you know, or South Carolina, which he probably would, but I don't know. But I think that the trend is going to be going in, in the wrong direction for Bernie. I don't see any sort of organic uh, groundswell of support like he had in 2016. He doesn't seem to have the same energy. And now the different situation is, you know, back in 2016 when he was running against, what, there was five candidates and Hillary from the start was pretty much going to win. Right, she already had the Democratic Party under her wing, and Bernie hadn't become a Democrat until maybe two years or you know, a couple months before. Was it six months? Two years? Six months before? And before that, he was an independent, so he didn't have any Democratic Party support. So there's, you know, no. The game was over before it even started for Bernie, just because of how the system was set up. But out of five candidates, of which there were only three semi-serious ones, and it was Lawrence Krauss, uh, Jim Webb, Martin O'Malley, then Bernie, then Hillary. So right from the start, Bernie pretty much was going against uh, one candidate, which was Hillary. And because he was so different than what you would normally expect, and he was offering the sun, moon, and stars, that was guaranteed to get him a lot of attention. And then from that, he got a lot of professional campaign help. He had, uh, you know, very, very, the top minds in influence and persuasion start to join his campaign. Robert Chiodini was working with him, uh, allegedly. And that takes you a long way. But I don't know if he's going to have that this year because there's about 20 different candidates. There's so many candidates that they can't fit them all on the, on the same debate stage. They're going to be having two different debate stages. And, <laughs> you know, they're going to have, I don't know if they're doing A team and B team, but they're going to have one night with randomly selected candidates and then another night of randomly selected candidates. And it's going to look a lot like the Republican field in 2016, where there was just so many candidates that you really had to do something special to set yourself apart. And I, <laughs> and if you want to know what that kind of looks like, it, it looks like something that is so wild that you can't help but talk about it. And Trump did this in an interesting way. If you remember the first, I think it was the first Republican national debate at the Ronald Reagan uh, hangar or whatever that, the Ronald Reagan library, something to do with Ronald Reagan, and it had the plane in the background. If you remember that, the first question that was asked to Donald Trump was they were concerned about his temperament in relation to having nuclear weapons. And... <laughs> Knowing that there's so many other candidates on the field, do you remember how Trump responds to the first question about his temperament regarding nuclear weapons? He started by saying something to the effect of, first of all, I don't know why Rand Paul is on the stage. There's far too many candidates as it is, and he's polling at 1%. He shouldn't even be here. And so when you, when you think about <laughs> how you can set yourself apart, that's certainly one way. And I'm wondering if $1,000 a month in universal basic income is enough to set Andrew Yang apart from the rest of the stage. I wonder if he's going to be able to shape the, the conversation that way. He has spoken about how he won, or he was a part of the U.S. debate team when he was in high school or college that had, you know, a bunch of awards and they went to London for some big, I guess, international debate stage or whatever. But I hope that he, I hope they, he doesn't personally take too much stock in that because the political debates aren't debates at all. Because a debate, a proper debate, is judged by a judge. So when you're on the formal debate stage, you have a judge who's assigning points for things like facts and, you know, did you take down the other person's argument with facts? But this isn't a debate. That would be a mistake to think of it that way. Rather, this is this, these debates are just excuses to persuade people. 
So you don't have a judge that you're trying to persuade. You're trying to persuade people. And when you're trying to persuade large amounts of people in the country, facts are pretty much irrelevant. Rather, what's more important is your persuasive ability and you know your persuasive content. But a lot of times, facts can get in the way of that. And I think that he's somewhat cognizant of that because a thousand dollars a month is pretty good persuasion. You know, it's big enough that you you have to think about it. You can't ignore that, and it's a big enough thing that you know people have to start talking about how this how the conversation might evolve is instead of thinking uh, that's impossible we can't do it you start to merge and shift slowly towards uh, is it possible and then from is it possible you get to well what's the best way to do it and then you're just arguing about details but you're pretty much there you've already you're, you're thinking past the sale at that point you're thinking that universal basic income is already necessary it's just a matter of how do we do it and once you get there, that's a pretty big deal. Now, I don't know if, if he's going to be able to actually win the entire presidency or if he's going to be able to win the Democratic nomination. But it seems to me as if he has everything that, that a candidate needs, at least for the black swan, come from nowhere type of candidate. And so <laughs> it's exciting. We'll see him on the debate stage. I think he still needs some more donations. I'm not sure if he actually needs the donations or if they've already invited him or whatever the technical details are, but I feel pretty confident if he's not already automatically on the debate stage, and this, this is just a free prediction for me, and my prediction that he'll be on the debate stage is pretty certain. So I don't know if there's any betting sites out there where you can bet on that, but that's just free money. Not saying that you should do that. This, that's not betting advice. It's not or investment advice or whatever. I'm just saying that it's a bet I would take. So I think that will be it for today. I think we covered everything I want to talk about. But look for the candidate that gets the most energy and look for the candidate that has the most organic uh, groundswell, grassroots type of appeal. And I will show you the candidate who's going to go really, really far. And, and just to be clear, in 2016, the candidate that had the most groundswell support, uh, you know, grassroots type of energy, you know, the people who are making all the memes and the people who are, who are really uh, gung-ho about the candidate, you're not going to like this, but it wasn't Bernie. It was Trump. And that's why I was able to predict Trump about a year before it happened. I, I predicted Trump in December of 2015. And in 2012, I predicted Obama, and then before then, I was too young to really even, you know, understand what was going on. So 2008, I was 14, 15, something along those lines. So uh, the the elections that I can clearly remember, and the elections that I've been, you know, old enough to follow, I've been able to predict the winner based on those two criteria, which is energy and who has the most organic support. And if you want to come up with a fun name for those two things, you can kind of call it the mandate of heaven, which was this <laughs> idea, uh, if you've ever played Kesson 2, which was about uh, three kingdoms period in China, there was this idea of the mandate of heaven. Whoever had the imperial seal had the mandate of heaven, which meant that they were meant to rule. And you can kind of see same, the same similarities with some candidates when they run, that there's just nothing that they can do that you know, goes wrong. Like Donald Trump seemed to have the mandate of heaven because he kept getting in and out of these precarious situations. So that's what you kind of look for, is who has the mandate of heaven. Not that that's a literal actual thing. It's more of a, a thing that represents energy and it represents uh, grassroots organic support. And the one that I see has it is Yang. It's not Kamala Harris. I, I don't see anyone talking about her. I don't see anyone excited about Kamala Harris. I live in New Jersey. I don't see anyone really excited about Cory Brooker. Uh, no one's too excited about Biden, Warren, Klobuchar, Gillibrand, nothing. Um, Castro, nothing that I can think of. Andrew Yang is the only one people are excited about in the Democratic nomination process. People. Now, the media is someone different. The media likes Kamala Harris, but as far as people go, they're excited about Andrew Yang. Okay, I think that will do it for today, and 
I was very happy to be able to talk with you all today, and I will see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.